stopped and as if by magic the recording started again that's great well thank you everybody that's um been to the previous session and we're now moving on to our next speaker obviously just to say another thank you there to vivox who are our sponsors for this session um i'm just going to get ready and upload the slides bear with me a second and we'll be moving on to um to john traxler and matt smith although i think it's just john that's giving the the talk today um that i'm sure he'll let us know i'm just going to get his slides up ready for you and there we go okay then john i'm going to pass over to you okay thank you am i audible you are audible i can hear you <laughs> Right, that's all I need. Um, and I can advance my slides, can I? You should be able to, yes. Right, fine. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to everyone. Um, I'm not sure if the slides are legible, but I've actually annotated them extensively. So if anyone wants a much fuller copy um, that's legible on whatever size of screen you've got, then just ask. Um, okay, it's supposed to start. Essentially, I'm reporting on a project that was commissioned by DFID, um, but mainly reflecting on the amount of thought and concern that it gave rise to. Uh, and ostensibly, it was about the role of learning technology in supporting education through crisis. And clearly, the crisis in question is uh, COVID-19. Um, and I'm reporting on behalf of my colleagues, Matt, Howard and Sarah, and we were working with well, it was the DFID Ed EdTech Research Hub. Now it's not DFID and now it's not research and all of the politics around that probably tell you something, just that I'm not quite sure at the moment what they tell you. So, um, let me move that on. Ah, okay, so some brief background to our project. It was commissioned about uh, three months ago and we've just finished the first report and they asked us to think about um, in the context of COVID-19 but also its aftermath you know the so-called new normal we hear so much about and know so little about um, digital responses that would support the continuity of education systems hmm, sounds easy um, and digital responses that would ameliorate the impact of COVID-19 of, of those responses uh, and that's where it gets rather more tricky. Um, so clearly we can do a lot using digital technology to support education systems, but we then get concerned about people who've already dropped through those education systems. Um, and this was our major concern, thinking this through, um, how the responses to COVID-19 actually further disadvantaged the disadvantaged. And we can kind of unpack what that might mean in terms of different cultures, peoples, communities, constituencies, and so on. The, the DFID phrase is marginalized. Um, they, they have a language of their own and they have a style guide uh, to go with it. Um, and the readership was intended to be decision makers, local and national, and with and without good infrastructure. So it's kind of a muddled brief. And they also mentioned early on something about south north reverse learning uh, originally the idea being that what we would learn from initiatives in the global south would help um, schools and systems in the global north um, as that actually isn't dfid's brief uh, i think that must have got dropped fairly quickly um, one of the challenges clearly given that readership the, the one about decision makers was actually thinking about what they could as it were actually hear um, it's quite easy, well, certainly very easy for me to get off on a, a rant, um, but, but very conscious that they wouldn't hear that. And, you know, furthermore, we needed to talk about what they could actually action rather than what sounded like, I don't know, motherhood and apple pie. You know, we all need more teacher development, so what? Um, okay, so that's, the, that's some of the background. Ah, the, um, the methods. Um, a systematic literature review, which is fairly straightforward. I mean, it's you know supposedly objective, and you work to a cookbook. And then some some Delphi sessions with a range of experts representing different kinds of expertise. So what in this instance I called minorities, which was someone with experience of working with Roma, with working with the San in Namibia, with Australian Aborigines. 
um, with the Cree in northern Canada and so on. And that was partly because I suppose the literature review, as it were, allowed us to read the papers we discovered, to read the lines, but we were hoping the experts would allow us to read between the lines. Um, and, and I think they did. Um, and then some case studies that might have thrown some light on what we were getting. So that was that was how it was set up. Um, maybe the practice was slightly more complex. I mean, apart from anything else, I was conscious of, if, if you like, structural difficulties. Um, that the systematic literature review is likely to hit the usual suspects. Uh, you know, if if you search on mobile learning uh, Global South, there's a fair chance you'll get as many hits as everyone else is getting um, and still have a lot of trouble digesting them. And I guess that um, resonated with a concern that, uh, bearing in mind that kind of everyone and their uncle is doing this stuff at the moment, you know, UNESCO, DFID, USAID, IDRC, and various other bits of DFID, that we could all be fishing in the same pool and not only duplicating our effort, but but reinforcing a kind of group think, you know, getting involved in a kind of international development chamber. And at a more practical level, it was actually really quite difficult to get what we were looking for from abstracts. You know, depending on the breadth of the search terms, you might have 3000 hits or 300. But if, at some point, you've still got to read them through for what you really want to know. Um, Certainly in international development, um, what you hear a lot of is, the, uh, well, the phrase unexpected consequences, and I happily provide examples of that, and multi-causality. Um, so that means if we were looking for successes that might have some relevance and transferability, the literature or even the reasoning behind it wouldn't actually tell you what caused that success. Um, and actually also there's other biases at work. Um, the bias in favour of, of success. You know, people by and large don't get promoted on the basis of their failures, which is why they don't write about them. Um, and then a bias in favour of academic authors rather than activists, programme managers, uh, people on the ground, who, for example, whose funding is not around academic dissemination, it's around getting the job done. There is also, of course, a, a global um, pressure to write in English, because otherwise your university doesn't go up the international rankings. Um, and what you're looking at when you're looking at research findings is what it was that funders choose, chose to, to fund. So in a sense, it's filtered by the research, by the funders' preferences as well as anything else. And then finally, in a more kind of philosophical sense, the marginalised are what is often called the hard to reach. Uh, and that's a kind of double whammy in the sense that they're not only hard to research about, but then they're hard to res to to help. Uh, so they're kind of doubly disadvantaged by the nature of their hard to reach. Other people, might, well, myself included, might say that institutions like us are hard to reach, and, it, and you know what international development calls the last mile in terms of communication is actually the first mile if you look at it from the other end. So there's a lot of kind of language at work here that's problematic when you're trying to do something useful and practical. So, uh, so did we have any findings? Yeah. Um, well, actually, one of the findings was the extent to which um, culture and context were overriding, paramount. Um, but also, of course, by their nature, culture and, and context are incompletely documented. Um, so if you're looking for causes somewhere buried in context and culture, you probably wouldn't find them because pro probably there had been um, research recognized or adopted. So in, in looking at what might work somewhere else, um, it's very difficult to see in a clear cut way what it was you could transplant, what idea, what tip, what technique could be abstracted from one situation and dropped into another. And I suppose, actually, on that basis, you could argue that I don't know, the workings of multi-causality might mean, actually, you, it's just as you tell someone about failures as it is to tell them about successes, because you don't really know what caused either of them. Um, systematic interviews are hard work. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I didn't manage to advance that slide. <laughs> right, I have done. 
Uh, not that there's very much on that one. Um, and, and finally, um, I hate to bite the hand that feeds me, academic writing is really difficult to plod through when you're looking for something specific. Um, okay, but I mean, I suppose more importantly, and what might be more interesting than hearing about a report, um, is what, if you like, I'd seen as the emergent dilemma. I've hinted at it earlier that responses to sustaining education systems risk increasing the disadvantage of those icked by them or oppressed by them or failed by them. And you can unpack that, that list. It might be nomads uh, and indigenous peoples um, who national education systems are trying to um, sedentarize, or they might be people like the San in Namibia who don't speak the nationally approved language. Um, and that's making me think of, sorry, there was a program, there was a film about Australian Aborigines called something like Mile Long Rabbit Fence, which makes that point about putting kids into state um, education systems. And there might be the, uh, the disabled or people excluded from schools, but actually bearing in mind that um, um, most education systems only address primary education. This means that most people are in that category of being marginalised because most of them are not in um, those school systems, which in most countries in the global south stop at primary. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, we were very concerned about how do you support education systems without actually exacerbating um, disadvantages of those people outside them. Um, did we have any answers? Uh, not so easy. Um, I mean, I suppose we'd make the point that actually many people in formal education systems, parents, learners, officials, um, teachers, you know, are actually inside the system and outside the system as well. Um, and so they uh, might on the one hand engage with what DFID and the donors and the agents or ed tech, which basically seems to mean those systems like an LMS that are dedicated and sold specifically for working in um, formal education systems and inhabit that world of informal digital technologies. Um, and so, yeah, one of our first observations was, as I've said here, most uh, most people have mobiles, access mobiles, and through them, they're the portal, um, especially in the global south, to social media, Web 2.0, which have all sorts of benefits um, Bearing in, of course, that there are always people without those technologies, and, um, but those technologies are owned, quote unquote, familiar, accessible, controlled by everyone. Um, and, and the technologies we're talking about, and it varies from culture to culture, from group to group, might be, you know, WeChat, Flickr, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, um, and a, a, maybe a greater level of sophistication, WordPress or Wikipedia. Um, and maybe they underpin. Uh, both formal education systems in a kind of semi-permeable way and the rest of real life where everyone is using them all the time. And our argument is that um, people are using these technologies to um, uh, create images, ideas, uh, opinions, um, information, uh, to, create, to create those, to discuss them, to transform them, uh, to consume them and that actually ought to have some value I mean, especially as it is incredibly robust I mean maybe in the literal sense in the global south many mobile network operators have um, base stations with um, uh, mounted on a truck you know so depending on the nature of the emergency you can suddenly um, create a mobile network where there wasn't one um, so most people do have that experience. And I, and, I, and I suppose we make the point that actually in generating their own eyes and images and discussing them, um, they're generating, well, in the words of Star Trek, learning, but not as we know it, Captain. Um, and it may not be good learning. They may all be you know, telling each other the earth is flat. Um, and so our recommendation is actually to try and um, support that, develop it, coach it, um, because it is highly resilient and it is universal and it is familiar. 
um, and to look at the ways in which many pedagogies, which are maybe very, very familiar to Alt uh, and the community out there in, in the UK, for example, how those pedagogies could be adapted. And we're thinking about um, hertagogy, self-directed learning, badges, e-portfolios, using game mechanics, um, curating and uh, critiquing online resources and asking governments to see if they can, in their own local context um, and with their own communities, um, reach out and look at ways those could be blended, integrated, taken over, appropriated, um, in ways that would reach out um, to work alongside with all of those communities that um, are marginalised and disadvantaged. That is kind of the last slide, unless there's one that says thank you. No, there isn't one that says thank you. I'll say thank you in that case. Um, and I'll stop and take questions, if that's okay. That was really interesting. Thanks, John. And I didn't even need to put up all of my little five minute warning signs or anything. It was so well that's to time. I gabbled so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat now to see whether or not there are any um, specific questions. There were a few comments that were coming in there, um, but I think it was a really, really great talk. Um, I've just Sarah's put a comment on there. Um, we've had good experiences using Rachel to support connectivity in rural areas. And she's put a link in there and wondering if anyone's used anything similar. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, John. It's not something I'm familiar with, but um, thanks for sharing the well, link. It would, I'm sorry, it would, um, I think my answer would be irrelevant. And my question would be, are the communities in question familiar with it? Um, mm. you know, are they confident? Do they own it? Have they got control of it? Um, and, and admittedly, there is probably some, well, very, very large grey area, you know, between if you like a kind of polarized account of informal digital learning and what's inside the um, ed tech bubble or the ed tech, you know, the dedicated professional ed tech community. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, the more we can put out there, the better. But um, if it's grabbed by the people in question, then fine, that's great, that's what we want. But if not, then forget it. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to kind of Im Im impose it. Um, and Taskins um, made a comment there just to say that she's from Ed Tech Hub and she found your talk very interesting and refreshing. She works a lot on decolonizing Ed Tech and online learning. So, um, sorry, yeah, and that was that was one of our issues as well about the momentum. Sorry, I mean, what we hear from USAID and UNESCO and DFID to all to a greater or lesser extent. Um, because of the, I guess, the political drive for scale, meaning cost effectiveness and sustainability, meaning mm. cost effectiveness, is a, a kind of default to broadcasting the cheapest content, which turns out to be content in American English. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so that's not kind of if it, well, you could. So you can then put that into the kind of bag of, of recolonization. Mm. Um, and so the communities most at risk from that are clearly the ones uh, marginal to uh, the, the corporate global north. And so, yeah, yeah we mentioned decolonization. And part of our problem is, if you, if you go back to the remarks about the hard to reach, that actually before we start worrying about are we um, supporting a decolonized learning is needing decolonized research methods to engage with these people to find out what it is they need or want. Yeah. You can't use colonised research methods to find out about decolonising education. <laughs> it sounds a paradox. <laughs> it's very true. Um, well, that's um, that's. There's a lot of um, a lot of support in the room for this conversation to continue. Um, by the look of it, and um, if you have a look there, Taskings also shared her um, her email address with you. If you um, oh, right. would like Sorry, to my, get in my, my eyesight's not so good. <laughs> um, um, but I think Taskin, you're you're doing one of the talks today as well, aren't you? So um, 
Oh, there we go. Different, slight, slightly different um, email address that she shared for you. Um, but yeah, we can put you in touch afterwards if um, if need be. But um, yeah, thanks ever so much. Um, so thank you for everybody that's uh, commented in the in the comments. Um, uh, I don't think that I've missed any specific questions, but um, we do have a couple of more minutes if there are any. And big thank you to um, uh, both of our presenters today and to uh, also to Matt as well who was um, presenting in in a, in a supportive way by dealing with all of the uh, questions there for Wendy so big thanks to Wendy and thanks to John and thank you to all of our lovely participants great to see so many people here and um, really good start to um, to our day day one of our uh, old scene summit so um, I'll pop the set of slides up there and uh, if you could all thank you in the usual way I can see lots of uh, some clapping going on and some smiley faces. I always love it. Um, oh, here we go. Tassine's just come in there quickly. John, if you could do this research exactly how you want, what would you change? Oh, great question there to get in at the last minute there. Did you catch that, John? So Goodness. Uh, <laughs> put you on the spot. Not well. Sorry, maybe. In the, oh, sorry. This is the question about how, you know if you could start all over again. Yeah. How would you get there if you weren't starting from here? Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, uh, we weren't asked that question, actually. Um, uh, no, sorry, I don't. Well, I suppose fun. we were in, implicitly tasked to say something original, so maybe we ought to have ignored the literature completely. Mm, excellent. Well, it looks like you and Taskeen are going to have a lot of conversations to have later. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, there's my timer going off, so I'm going to stop recording now. And, um, and then I think the next session is starting in the next couple of minutes. So I'll say bye-bye for now and um, see you all soon. Thanks, John. Thanks, Wendy.